Hi, Professor Rick Rapetti here again. Our lecture for today is on ancient India, ancient Indian philosophy, the mythic era, prior to the scriptures being written down. We are now, this is the first of my lectures for the second half of the course on Asian philosophy, the first half being on Western, the ancient Western philosophy, Greco-Roman. So this is um, Indian philosophy and Chinese philosophy. So we're starting with the Indian, and this is the very first lecture. Like I said, before we get into details, this is a kind of overview about the context, the period, like in my lecture on the Greeks, we talked about Greek myth before we got into the actual Greek philosophers, because the mythic period is the worldview into which the Greek philosophers arose and started questioning things, right? So we saw that with the ancient Greeks, Romans came later right up into the Christian era thread. And now we're gonna do a similar thing here in, in the Asian philosophical tradition. So let me share my screen. I hope you're enjoying the Indian music in the background. A little flair I should have thought of when I was doing the ancient Greeks. Okay. Yes, this is a mountain range. Let's just suppose that it's the Himalayan mountain range, which separates India and subcontinent, the continent below the rest of Eurasia. And the Himalayan mountain range is between India and Tibet and Nepal and Afghanistan and all those areas, and Pakistan, and whatever. Take a look at a map if you're not sure what I'm referring to. Okay. So, pre-scriptural mythic era. Just like with Homer and Hesiod, whose stories probably were passed on orally for quite some time uh, before being written down. In the Indian tradition, we have good reason to think that these stories, the myths that became the scriptures were passed down for hundreds, if not thousands of years. <coughs> but let's pause to talk about the meaning of the word myth. When we say Greek myth, we can say that nowadays because most Greeks gave up polytheism. 2,000 years ago, roughly speaking. So, you know, we don't say Greek, I'm um, sorry, we don't say Christian myth or Jewish myth because there are adherents to those religions who believe these stories are true. So yet they are still myths in this other sense. Myth can mean something that's like a made up fiction that has meaning, but it can also mean not necessarily fiction, but just a, a kind of guiding narrative, a kind of stories that convey a worldview, a whole system of values, meanings, culture, knowledge, right? Myths have a kind of archetypal nature to them. If it's a good myth, it'll tap into something about human nature or about the nature of the cosmos, right? which is kind of figural, um, archetypal. Think of the Greek concept of the arche, right? That unifying principle that explains everything else. Archetype has the word arche in it and type, right? So archetypes are when there's more than one arche, right? There's different types of arches, archetypes. So the archetype of, you know, the sage, the archetype of the seeker. So these are kind of symbolic representations that appear in all sorts of narratives and stories told by human beings throughout the millennia that have deep meaning, even if they're not true. 
like the Adam and Eve story, the fall, the hero's journey, all of those things. These are elements of myth. And it's secondary from this perspective, this meaning of the term myth, whether or not the myths are literally true, right? But in Indian culture, in Hinduism and other Indian religions, the myths are also considered by most people in those cultures to be true till to this day. So, um, of course, opinions vary about that, but so I wanted to make that point clear. So, but just like with the Greek myths, right? There's a, you know, from a, the point of view of people who don't think that they're true, right? From the scientific perspective, so, well, how do these, stories arise, well, they, you know, how the belief in all sorts of gods arise. Recall, we made the same argument with the Greeks that it involved an element of anthropomorphic projection. Anthropos means uh, mankind in Greek, humanity, human beings. Study of them is anthropology. Anthropos and logos put together words, knowledge, intelligibility, understanding, meaning about anthropos, mankind, right? So, but anthropomorphic projection, if you recall, is like when a dog shows his teeth, if it's a cute dog, you might think he's smiling, right? Or he's happy. Um, you're projecting human emotions onto an animal that you're not so sure if they have those same emotions, right? That's projection of human-like qualities onto non-human things is anthropomorphic projection. So early human beings would see that the sky is angry. It would seem angry because it's loud and violent and destructive. And that's how we are when we're angry, we're loud and violent and destructive. So we assume that the sky has a mind like we do and moods and attitudes and emotions, right? So something huge like the sky has a mind and it's very powerful it makes sense to think that it's some kind of God, a supernatural being, right? The mind of the sky or something like that, or the mind of the sea. Well, same thing in ancient India. This is a kind of anthropological, psychological explanation. If these myths are not true, how did human beings come to believe them? Okay, and then the other thing is, okay, we say the sky God, right? Then we give it a name, right? Like Zeus. Right, that's called personification, turning it into a person. It's one thing to project person like qualities, and it's another thing to say it's a person. Right, the sky is the body of the god Zeus, the ocean is the body of the god Poseidon, and so on. Right, well, in ancient Hinduism, I'll get back to that word in a moment, Agni is the god of fire. Of course, early humans were very impressed by fire. In fact, the Greeks say that Prometheus stole fire from the gods, right? Because it's so powerful. It has this power, tremendous power of destruction to burn down whole villages and cities and, you know, whatever, to heat and to cook and everything, right? And then the sun is a god, Surya right? In the Greeks, the sun is the god Apollo, right? So there's a yoga, a sequence of yoga poses that if anybody's ever taken a yoga class, that there's that one that you often, often begin yoga classes with. It's called a sun salutation, Surya Namaskar. Namaskar is like namaste, which has become popular enough that almost everybody knows when people begin or end a yoga class or a meditation, they might put their hands in a prayer gesture, and say namaste and bow their head a little, which means something like, I bow to the being, the spirit that's in you, or the light that's in you, or the divinity in you, right? Or I bow to the place in you where we are one being, right? So Surya Namaskar is the salutation to the sun. So to this day, even yogis, practitioners of yoga around the world, do a sun salutation in the morning, you honor the sun because you're benefiting from the light, right? Okay, so I said I would speak about Hinduism. It, you know, India is a word based on the Indus River that runs throughout India, um, like the Ganges River, right? But, uh, one of the earliest civilizations in mankind's history was uh, around the Indus Valley, 
right? So the word Hindu comes from Indus and India, right? The land of the Hindus. Uh, so the word Hinduism really means any Indian religion in a sense, in the broadest sense. But we didn't, the word Hindu, I think it came about in the 19th or the 20th century at the, at the latest or the 19th at the earliest um, for that land and for that, the, for those religions, there are so many different religions in India. We just kind of lop them all together and call it Hinduism, right? But there's uh, six Orthodox Hindu philosophies and a handful of other unorthodox or heterodox, right? Which means more than one. Orthodox means there's that word dox as in paradox with the Greek words. Ortho means straight line. So orthodox, your beliefs are in a straight line. Dox means belief, something like belief. That's one of the interpretations, right? And heterodox, so orthodox, it's one line, right? Like a straight line. Heterodox, hetero, it's like in heterosexual is male and female, right? Uh, attraction. Um, so heterodox means more than one belief, right? Multiple beliefs, okay? So, um, yeah, so there's orthodox Hinduism. And technically, I mean, heterodox religions in India are generally not called forms of Hinduism, but in a sense they are, if you accept that broadest category for Hinduism to mean religions of India, right? So like Buddhism came out of India, it's a modification of Hinduism, but it's considered unorthodox, but it's, you know, in my mind, it's kind of like Hinduism, almost like Christianity is a form of Judaism, although most people don't call it that. It is. Its founder was a very famous Jew named Jesus. Okay, so I mentioned that this is an oral tradition passed on for many, many generations from father slash priest to son slash priest. You're born into the priesthood in Indian culture. And the name for the priesthood is the Brahmins. A Brahmin is a priest as a member of the caste system. We'll talk more about that, but I'm sure you were exposed to what the caste system is in high school by now, if not junior high school or earlier. All right. But um, one of the distinctive things about early Hinduism is its rituals, right? Fire ceremonies involving incense, flames, like candles and or wax, you know, um, other things that burn. Like ghee is a kind of clarified butter that burns, right? Uh, like, a, like a candle flame um, with offerings and incantations. And an incantation is a kind of like a spell like in witchcraft, right? And mantras are like spells or prayers or just phrases or words that are chanted over and over and over again to put the practitioner into the state of mind that is reflected by the meaning of the mantra, which is believed to connect that person's mind to that part of the universe that the meaning is about. So if it's a chant to the god Agni, the fire god, then it puts the chanter's mind in connection with that god and then it's believed that somehow or another the blessings of the god agni or agni's powers come into the mind of the practitioner right um the earliest scriptures in hinduism which were first written down are called the vedas v-e-d-a-s right and the earliest ones are almost all about rituals and how rituals are practiced and ought to be practiced to uphold the cosmic order. The cosmic order, like the word cosmos in Greek, right, um, is an ordered world, right? Not a disordered world. It's something integrating and unifying the world in the concept of cosmos. Same thing in, in ancient Hinduism. The word is Rita, the cosmic order, R-I-T-A. You might know a woman named Rita right? But that's what the word means in Sanskrit. By the way, Sanskrit is the language of ancient India, particularly of the priesthood. It's still spoken by the Brahmins, 
because all of their prayers and everything are spoken in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is to modern Indian languages what Latin is to modern Romance languages like Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian, and so on, right? Um, the priesthood in the Catholic religion still speak Latin, even though they might not do the masses in Latin anymore. But when I was a kid, a good part of the mass was still in Latin. Um, same thing with Sanskrit, um, only it's much more widespread. Uh, the use of Sanskrit in the, in the modern priesthood, uh, all the prayers and rituals and mantras are in Sanskrit. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a quick overview. So I mentioned the Vedas and the Upanishads. The Upanishads are a subset of the Vedas, right? but they're named their own separate name um, because they came later and they have a slightly, well, a significantly different focus. Whereas the Vedas, like I said um, on the previous slide, were more about rituals and cosmic order, about the gods and all that kind of stuff and the caste system and how the world was created and all that kind of stuff. The Upanishads are more spiritual, so to speak, and they're more oriented toward the individual's attainment of enlightenment through yoga and meditation and other things like that, right? Through spiritual disciplines and practices. Okay, so yeah, the Vedas came about 1200 before the Common Era, so that would be, add 2000 years to that, they're as old as 3,500 years old um, and probably much older verbally before they started to get written down. And the Upanishads are, they, they, they start in the, before the common era, um, but they, because they were around, they were around at the time of the Buddha already and the Buddha was around 500s before the common era BCE, but they run right up until about 500 years ago, 1500, the year 1500 in the common era or AD, right? BC and AD before Christ and Anno Domini, year of our Lord is what that means. And that doesn't mean after death as many people think. Okay, so yeah, they have a biblical validity in Indian culture. Right, they are the source of all culture and in, in the Hindu worldview and the Hindu belief system, right? And the source of all values and meaning and everything else, right? And they were written down by individuals called rishis, which um, is often spelled R S I but pronounced rishi, and which means seers. A seer is like an oracle, or a mystic, or a prophet, right? one who sees the deeper truth and reality, if not seeing the future or seeing with godlike eyes, right? Um, and the Vedas are right. There are several of them, and they each one of them is Bible-sized in length. So like the Hindu scriptures fill up a whole row on a shelf in a library, whereas the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, you know, just a couple of books like that, right? Um, yeah, oh, and Vedas, um, I believe, means something like seen, or what was seen by the seers. But the, the word video, I believe, comes from Veda, right? That which was seen by the seers, right? And they are considered like mediums in this similar way that Homer and Hesiod in the Greek tradition, the poets, were believed to be inspired or possessed by the daughters of Zeus, by gods, basically, the muses, right? The rishis were believed to be like mediums speaking the language of God directly, right? They were like faucets uh, through which the wisdom of the universe spoke directly out of their mouths, right? And like the truths in the Vedas are considered eternal truths that are built into the structure of the universe, almost like the voice of God. And, you, you know, the word logos would work for this, right? Because logos means word. It's as if the spiritual universe, right? Think back about Neoplatonism, right? There's the one, and then there's the logos, 
or nous, which is the mind of the one, in which are the forms. And the forms are all the meanings and dispositions and characteristics of the mind of God, so to speak, right? The, the realm of pure ideas. Those are eternal, as Plato put it, right? Same thing here, right? The truths spoken in the Vedas are believed to just be verbal manifestations that the seers directly perceived like platonic forms and spoke. So they're considered eternal truths, right? And mantras are considered like little, like almost like a key or like in a video game when you unlock something because you get enough coins and then a code is revealed to you that has a power to do other things in the game. Mantras have this magical incantation like thing to them where they do the same thing. They open you up mentally to some deeper dimension of reality or some aspect of reality, some psychic power or something like that, like in magical incantations or a witch's spells or something like that. But mantras are considered to come not from magic, but directly from, you know, this godlike realm of the universe, right, that the seers saw. The mantra Om, for example, that begins and ends many Hindu and Buddhist prayers or mantras, they begin, many of them begin and end with Om, Om this, blah, 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 Om, Om that, blah, 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 Om, right? Om is kind of like Amen, but Amen in a kind of like Italian sense where you can say ciao to say hello or goodbye, right? To begin or end the prayer. Om can begin or end the prayer, but what Om means it's believed to be the sound of logos, you know, to use a Greek concept, right? The sound of the spiritual universe, the, the vibration or the body of the Holy Spirit, the logos of the whole universe, right? The, the world soul, as the Neoplatonists called it, right? So something like that. But the other interesting thing is the last bullet on my slide. And there's a picture of Soma there with light coming out of it right? Magic in the, in the woman's um, cup there. Soma was some kind of elixir of the gods. Um, there's a book about this called Food of the Gods, um, about the power and the, the role of psychedelics in human history to trigger mystical experiences. One of my meditation teachers named Ramdas, uh, he died a couple of years ago, um, in this tradition. I just saw a, a film clip of him saying that the founders of every religion are individuals who are capable one way or another of entering into deep altered states that put them into communion with this kind of thing that I've been talking about, which we could just call logos or something, right? In tune with the cosmic mind or the one, right? And of course, one of the many ways in that book, Food of the Gods, that human beings did this is through psychedelics, magic mushrooms, peyote, you know, ayahuasca, this, that, or the other thing, right? Um, it may have even played a role in human evolution, according to that book, uh, because our ancestors were hunter-gatherers and they followed the bison and the big woolly mammals um, in the trail of whose fertilizing manure, magic mushrooms grow in plentitude, right? So it very well may be that our ancestors ingested psychedelic mushrooms, and that's what opened them up to do cave paintings and things like that. Who knows? It's just a speculative thing. Um, but there's some evidence in favor of thinking that. Okay, so yeah, they call it Soma, and it's written about in the Vedas, but we don't have the exact formula, the recipe for it. It's something that was concocted, like ayahuasca is concocted from vines and roots and this and that, and it's fermented and it takes six months, whatever. But Soma was considered like a liquid that you drink that puts you in contact with the, the logos, so to speak. They don't, once again, I'm using the word because I know those of you who are in the course now, but maybe not people watching this video later on online, you already got exposed to the concept of the one and the logos, you know, the world soul, and all that kind of stuff from Neoplatonism, which goes back to Plato, right? So this is just a useful way for me to refer to it, but the, in, in Hinduism, they don't use this terminology and they have a slightly different metaphysical understanding of all of that, but it's very similar in that regard. Okay, so yeah, they took Soma 
psychedelic elixir that connected them with the gods. And um, I don't have to say, don't go out and take any Soma because we don't know how to find it or how to make it. All right. Okay, so let's let's go into some of the other Vedic ideas. All right, I already talked about Rita, cosmic order, which is upheld by uh, Vedic rituals, the chanting of mantras, the lighting of Agni, the fire god, burning of incense, which sends up a nice scent into the universe, chanting, and so on, right? It, it, it's considered, in fact, our duty to do that. Like we, it's almost like, um, like when somebody dies and the pallbearers are the men who carry the, um, usually men, it doesn't have to be, uh, carry the casket, right? If you're a close relative in some, in some families, they'll expect you to get up and do that and be one of the ones who does that. It's your duty or in any event at the, the priesthood, the members of the priesthood, particularly, it's their duty to perform these rituals. It's believed, it's almost like, um, like um, the, um, the guy on the old train whose job it is to keep shoveling coal into the engine to keep it running, right? It's his job to keep the train running by shoveling the coal in there, right? So in this belief system, the priesthood, it was their job to perform these things, to keep the universe running, to keep it in order, because all those ideas came right out of the universe. It's like, if the universe in this analogy is the train, the train told the engineer, you gotta keep shoveling coal and that's your job, right? Um, so it's that kind of thing, because the Vedas prescribe what needs to be done to keep itself, this cosmos thing running. You know, this information allegedly came from the cosmos itself, right? And the word dharma means your role or your duty, right? In ancient Indian belief system, the concept and the word get changed in Buddhism later on, right? But dharma is also based on your caste, all right? So I said we'd talk a little bit about caste. Castes are determined by birth, right? You were born into the priesthood. And as you should know, there are four castes. There's the priesthood at the top. Then there's the warrior or royalty class, which is anybody in the military or government or leadership, police, judicial system, all of that, right? That's like the legal or warrior military, the military, you know, kind of thing, representatives of the society, the social political structure, right? Then the third are the skilled, uh, what Plato, uh, uh, what Socrates would refer to as the craftsmen, right? People with technical knowledge, right? Interestingly. And then the fourth is the kind of unskilled workers, masses, consumers, laborers, unskilled labor, right? That's the caste system. Uh, and we'll say more about that later because there's a myth about the caste system. But um, so, but your caste, you, you're born into a caste and you, you normally can't leave that caste until your next lifetime because they believe in karma and reincarnation. So when we hear about the caste system, it might have been presented to you in, in, in school when you first heard about it as if it was socially unjust or unfair. But in this belief system, it's not considered unfair or unjust because they believe in reincarnation, which is that when you die, your spirit, your mind, your soul, and your dispositions and habits, your karma, your, you know, your history, your habits, whatever, all that stuff, gets born again, reincarnate in the carne. Carne means meat, right? Flesh, chili con carne, you know, chili with meat, right? So you're in the flesh, incarnate again, reincarnation, right? So, and karma is the law of, in Brooklyn, as we say, this is a Brooklyn college, uh, what goes around comes around or what comes around goes around, depending, doesn't matter, goes both ways, right? So it's the law, the moral law of cause and effect. So if you do good deeds, you have good karma, and then good things will happen to you. You find a wallet, you return it with the money in it, you know, you got some good karma, right? Um, that's a simplification. It's a much more complicated, it's all about like moral version of Newton's laws of cause and effect. Every action has a reaction, right? That kind of thing. Okay, so if you believe in that, 
then you believe that you're born into the caste where you belong because the universe is orderly. That's Rita, right? And it has a whole Dharma built into it. It has a, an order that's not just descriptive the way things are, but it's the way things ought to be. It's prescriptive, right? So the whole universe, everything happens for a reason in Hinduism, right? And they have a lot of the reasons figured out as far as they're concerned, right? Karma and reincarnation make an awful lot of sense. And if you recall, when we did the problem of evil for Augustine and for Epicurus in the Western philosophical tradition, we said that one problem with the theodicy, if you recall, what is a theodicy? It's the defense of God's goodness in the face of the problem of evil, right? God's righteousness, theo and decon, right? The theodicy is the explanation for how God allows evil. If God's a good and all-knowing and all-powerful being, right? had a problem with explaining when horrible things happen to innocent children and stuff like that, right? Well, Hindu theodicy doesn't have that problem. It can explain, right? Um, when a horrible thing happens to what appears to be an innocent baby, because that soul in that baby's body might have been a Hitler in a previous life. It's its karma. So there's this belief that everything happens for a reason. So when things, horrible things happen to seemingly good and innocent people, it's just automatically assumed that that's their karma, right? It all evens out in the end, right? And I said, this is, in a sense, a very compassionate God running that religion, if there is one, right? Because it gives you an infinite number of chances to get it right. And then you become enlightened, right? Well, that's another idea um, about the whole purpose of the whole thing. But um, so getting back to castes, you're born into the caste system that you belong in based on your karma and your spiritual evolution of your soul and your psyche, right? So it's kind of like, you know, one of the examples would be, um, what's his name? Michael Jordan, right? He seems to have the karma of being an excellent basketball player before he was born. He, he was born with those karmic abilities. He cultivated those athletic skills already in a previous lifetime that would be the interpretation so like if there was a cast for basketball players he would be naturally born into it and Ivor Repetti wouldn't be uh, I found basketball a little difficult to, to uh, come naturally to me right like came really naturally to him um, there's another story about caste system that a friend of mine who I taught a course with on religion and ethics at Vassar College once, Professor Rick Jarrow, he told this story about an orphan in India who found a guru, a spiritual teacher, who took him in. And when the guru asked the kid, what's your caste? Because he had no markings on him to indicate his caste. The kid said, I don't know. I'm an, I'm an orphan, right? The, um, the guru said, well, then you must be a Brahmin because truthfulness is one of the dispositions of the Brahmin, right? Because the Brahmin is the closest to the truth, right? They are the seers or in the lineage of the seers. They're closest to ultimate reality, okay? So that's, that's just a, two little stories about, you know, the orphan kid and the Michael Jordan with karma and dharma, right? And the caste system, right? It's my dharma if I'm born into the priesthood to perform the rituals. It's my dharma if I'm born into the warrior caste to be a warrior and not to be a pacifist, right? It's my moral obligation. Make some analogies to also further justify that. If you're a parent and you have a child, it's your dharma to raise that child. If you're a child and you have a, a, an elder parent, it's your dharma to take care of them when they can't take care of themselves anymore, right? If you're a police officer, then it's your dharma to be a just police officer, fair, and so on, right? Um, do what you can also, however, to lock up criminals and so on. Okay, so the focus in this whole system is religious, right, for everybody. So if you're, no matter what caste you're in, it's your dharma, it's your religious obligation to perform the duties that come with your role. A caste is a role, like parent, sibling, police officer, truck driver, garbage man. It doesn't matter what your role is. Your moral and spiritual obligation, your religious duty is to uphold the virtues 
right? The best character traits that are associated with that role, right? So being a teacher, one of the better characteristics of a, of a good teacher would be to be fair in grading and being able to pitch assignments to the skill level of the students, to encourage them and not rip them apart, you know, all this kind of thing, right? So this is the kind of ethics that goes along with this, right? But it's all ultimately tied to the idea of Rita upholding the cosmic order. Everybody has a place in the same universal body because just like in Neoplatonism, right? There's the one and all the many are parts of the one, right? So there's a, a metaphor that comes from Stoicism, which I didn't share when we were talking about Stoicism, um, that goes like this. Well, it's one of the metaphysical ideas of Stoicism is that the whole universe is one living organism. Right in ancient Stoicism, we don't believe that anymore. If you're a modern Stoic, you believe in science, so you don't necessarily believe that, right? But at the time, it was believed. So there's a metaphor that says your foot is a part of your body. So if you need to cross a muddy patch of land, right, the foot has to step in the mud. The foot might not want to, it, it doesn't feel right, it's gooey, it's disgusting, but it's the job, it's its moral obligation, it's its duty to get the body across that patch of mud so it has to step through the mud, right? So it's part of the greater collective, right? So same thing here, no matter what your role is, your finger on the hand, you know, whatever it is, you're part of a larger system of order and you have to uphold your part to keep the whole system going, right? To uphold Rita. And a significant part of that is like Euthyphro's attitude right, towards the divinity, right? You have a religious duty to do what? Euthyphro's third definition, his final definition, is to tend to the gods, right? To take care of the gods. It's your job as a human being <coughs> to uphold your religious duty, your service to the gods, to the cosmos, the, you know, like a child to its parent, okay? So that's the divine command theory is really significantly deep, in uh in the hindu model okay <clears throat> so a little bit more about the caste system it's based on a myth that comes out of one of the uh, vedas i forget which one about god's body parts right just like the foot on the body in the stoic metaphor with the mud right there's a myth about god's body separating right um into uh, certain body parts right the head and the mouth right? Your brain is where the mind is and the mouth speaks the thoughts of the mind. And so that's the priestly cast. So you see the head and the mouth on the left side in my two boxes on the screen. And on the right side, you've got the priestly cast, the Brahmins, right? They speak for and to the gods, right? The next one, this is a, a body metaphor, right? So the head and the mouth are the Brahmins, right? The arms, that's what warriors use mostly, right? To fight, and spears and arrows and all that kind of knives and whatnot, right? So the arms protect society. That's the warriors on the right side of the screen called Kshatriya. Or Kshatriya, I think it's a sh Kshatriya. And then the legs on the left side, right? They, workers walk around and bring the body and, and, and all that kind of thing. And they uphold the body with strength and all that. So those are the skilled workers. Right, the biggest muscles in your body are your quads, right, and your hamstrings, right. So that's where this this kind of you know, ox the ox cart kind of model, right. That's where the work is being done. And then the feet, that's the ones that have to step in the mud, right. Those are the unskilled workers. Oh, I forgot to say, the skilled workers are called shudras, and then the unskilled workers are called the vaisyas, right? They're just the laborers. That's your job. And then you move up the caste system, by the way. And on the right side, there's five bullets because there's the, the fifth bullet is not really part of the system. They're outside the system and they're called the Dalits. Um, and uh, they are non-caste members and they are often referred to as untouchables because they had to do all the real dirty work, like handle corpses and sewers and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Do the most gross and disgusting work. And there's a theory about how that could happen. Like, how could that be if these are all parts of the body of God? And the theory is, and I'm not so sure um, 
how many historians or anthropologists buy into this one. But one theory that I read about the historical origins of this is that the, the civilization that the Vedas comes with, right, a kind of ethnic group migrated into India early on in Indian history, and they were civilized, right? They had this whole belief system and structure and rituals and, you know, agriculture and all sorts of skills and knowledge. And so they were civilized. And the word for, for, for um, civilized is more like noble, right? The word noble, like the gentry, the nobles, the aristocrats, right? The civilized folks. So there was a time in human history when you had tribes of people, you know, living in jungles who aren't civilized at all. They just might have had, you know, sharp sticks, you know, and stones as their weapons came in contact with more civilized peoples, right? So maybe when the civilized nobles, and the word in Sanskrit for noble is Arya, A-R-Y-A, and in English, Aryan, the, the, the name of the ethnic group is similar. Some historians think it was an actual ethnic group from the Caucasus region, the Aryan people that might have invaded India at the time, many, many thousands of years ago. But others think, no, it just means civilized, right? And it doesn't have that ethnic uh, thing to it, right? So because the word in Sanskrit just means noble, right? But uh, this theory is that the civilized folks, when they invaded India originally, and there was no civilization there, the conquered peoples became the Dalits, the untouchables, like they were enslaved in some way or turned into servants, right? And made them do all that because they didn't have social status within the Varna system. The caste system is called the Varna in, in um, Indian culture, okay? All right, so here's a picture of it. It's a pyramid thing, it's a hierarchy, right? Oh yes, non-Aryans, right? Yeah, so there it is right there on that slide, right? So there's a pretty widespread belief, whether or not it's historically accurate, it's a debatable thing, right? That it might have been, whether it's ethnic or, or just civilized, either way, right? It's still, there's this distinction between the civilized, whether there was a specific ethnic group or not, but if they came in and they had a civilization, then they were probably of a different ethnic group than the ones that they conquered. But it doesn't mean that they called themselves Aryans as an ethnic group from a certain region who knows where they were from or if this actually happened right but uh, so this is just another map right um, at the top on the right hand side priests and academics and scholars literary folks who read or speak Sanskrit right the warriors kings law legal all that then the business community like olive oil trade to potato farmers, whatever, anybody who has a skill on how to do things like agriculture is one thing, but the other, the people who work for them and or under them or do menial labor, servants, people who wash your dishes for you and cook your food for you, whatever, right? They're subordinate. So this is a hierarchy of social superiority and privileges and rights, right? And so on, okay? So yeah, on the left side, You've got the Brahmin priests, Kshatriyas, warriors, Vaisyas, herders, farmers, merchants, craftspeople. There's, there's Plato's craftspeople that Socrates interviewed, right? But remember, Socrates questioned them. He questioned the politicians, which is the Kshatriyas. They're in the warrior caste because like when a warlord takes over a city, he becomes the king, right? So that the warrior and the royalty class is the same class. And the police, anybody who works for the government is considered in that, all right? And Sudras are, are the, uh, just the kind of laborers. Um, okay. Oh, so I, I already gave these justifications because uh, I kind of get a little excited when I'm talking about this stuff. But yes, there's this spiritual evolution model in the same way that in Neoplatonism, there, everything is part of the one and there's only one, right? But there's many at the same time, but the many are all part of the one right? Everything is God. So there's this element of what's called pantheism. Pan means all, right? Um, like a panacea is a cure-all, right? Um, is that the right word? Um, pandemic is like big, and affects everybody, right? The word pan. Pan American Airlines is an airline. I don't know if they're still around, but it meant that they traveled throughout the Americas, 
right? So pan means all, and pantheist means you believe that everything is God. The whole universe is God. That's a, a belief called pantheism, right? Um, so there's this belief in this belief system that everything is God, right? But everything, God is creative energy, and you have that also in Neoplatonism, right? The one manifests as the logos, which is a kind of creative emanation, a spreading out from the one, right? And then there's this transcendence where everything that God kind of spreads out and becomes everything, and then also everything evolves back up and transcends, rises back up into God. So there's this belief that at, throughout an endless series of universe cycles, God is just creative energy, like a cosmic artist. It's boundless energy and it's just creative and right. And so it creates everything. And all and to the furthest reaches, like in Neoplatonism, is the, the candle beams reaching out into the darkness that are the least real, right? And the least conscious. They have the less, the least amount of being. They're thin when it comes to being. Same thing. God becomes plants and minerals, soil, rock, sand, all that kind of stuff, and evolves slowly back up. So, but every little part of the universe is some kind of soul, which is something like a drop of God, right? That goes through the karma and reincarnation cycle. God, like, kind of extends outward from totality and perfection into the most finite and least part of itself and then evolves back up this is weird kind of model about the eternal ebb and flow of god right um so the up the scale there's rocks and things that aren't conscious they're unconscious but they still minded in this model everything has god in it and then plants evolve and then animals evolve. And then within the animal cycle, you move up from less evolved to more evolved through a reincarnational karmic cycle. Then you become a human. And then within the human realm, there's the forecasts. And you work your way up from being a kind of more like an animal-like human, just doing manual labor all the way up to becoming a priest. And, you know, when you're good in your caste, you move up and you get born in your next lifetime or after a whole bunch of them into the next caste. That's how you evolve until you become a kind of angelic celestial being, an angel or even a god like being. And then you become at one with God again, the Brahman, the all right, the one. And karma determines how that happens. It's all the law of cause and effect. Everybody belongs where they are. They, they wind up where they belong. So that's another thing about there's no evil in that world in the sense that everything is just. Justice always happens because everybody constantly gets what they deserve from their own karma, right? Of course, that determines the caste system. And your duty in every life depends on where you find yourself based on your karma, right? Whether you're a priest, a warlord, a doctor, a farmer, a mother, and so on. Okay. So, so a lot of what I'm saying doesn't apply to all forms of Hinduism, right? But it applies to many, if not most of them, all right, of, of Orthodox Hinduism. Right? There are versions of it that are very distinct. And when we, later on in one of the next lectures, maybe even the next lecture, there are the six orthodox schools of Hinduism that have distinct beliefs that diverge from this, although they're all based on the Vedas. Right? That's what they have in common. That's what makes them orthodox. And some unorthodox or heterodox ones like Buddhism and Jainism and so on. Right? Um, Sikhism. There's others. Right. Uh, but not even all the orthodox ones have the same view, but they all these the views that I'm espousing come out of the Vedas and the Upanishads. OK, so I said that you've got pantheism in there, but you've also got monotheism. Brahman is one. It's the one Brahman. Right. The formless God out from which the world of forms, the world of the many emerges. Right. So, but that one formless God manifests instead of one logos, three kind of logoi. Logoi is the plural of logos. Logos is singular, right? Cosmic principles. So it's an interesting trinity, right? Three gods emerge out of Brahman in this one model anyway, 
Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is the creator god. So it's like the god of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is a sub-god. Brahman is the formless being outside of time and space, which in the Judeo-Christian Islamic world, we sometimes think of God as that, right? But God is the creator, right? So in the Judeo-Christian Islamic complex, the creator and the God outside of time and space is the same one, right? Well, here it's the same one also, but it's differentiated, right? The formless being gives rise, emanates, like in Neoplatonism, into three, right? The creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, right? So Brahma is the creator. And so Brahma, Brahma comes out of Brahman, and Brahma creates the world, right? Like the god of the Bible. Vishnu preserves the world, right? Upholds the world. Right. So whenever God needs to intervene in the world to reset and help the cosmic order, Vishnu incarnates as a different avatar. An avatar is, like the word in the video games, comes from this belief system. And av avatar means introduction. So God introduces himself into the world as a prophet or a sage or a god. So from the point of view of Hinduism, Jesus, any kind of sage, prophet, holy man, or god from any religion that they'd say, oh, the god that walked the earth is really Vishnu in disguise or Vishnu in drag, right? So the Hindus believe Buddha was Vishnu, Jesus was Vishnu, Muhammad was Vishnu, right? And God takes form in different forms in different cultures at different times throughout history, not only in this world cycle, but in all previous ones and all future ones. I told you the whole universe is created and absorbed back into itself at the end of a cycle. Vishnu is the one who appears in the world like an avatar of God in the video system, which is the game of life, right? And helps out a little bit every now and then. Um, and then Shiva is the god who absorbs the whole world back into himself uh, at the end of a cycle, right? And But he meditates throughout the history of the world. In the end, he, he performs this action. And the gods do other things in the meantime, but their primary role is to create, maintain, and absorb, right? Emanate, maintain, and transcend track the world right okay so yeah all gods are avatars they are vishnu and drag they intervene to help and that's um shiva is on the right side of your screen with the trident the three-pronged stick right um brahma's in the middle the creator and vishnu is on the left side depicted with many different heads because Vishnu has sent in many different avatars. Some of them aren't even human, like the elephant god or the monkey god or the cow god, which is why they don't eat cows, right? A cow is a sacred animal, the sacred cow, as it's called, right? We say in philosophy, there are no sacred cows, meaning there, there are no topics that are illegitimate for philosophers to discuss, because philosophy is all about examining every single idea. Okay, so that's a, a really interesting overview. You've got a blend of monotheism and polytheism and pantheism, which we talked about on the previous slide, although the word didn't appear there, it'll appear in a moment. Okay, and then you've got, uh, so pantheism, everything is God. Henotheism is similar to the Greeks. You could say the Greeks had a kind of henotheism because you got one top God among a whole pantheon. So in Zeus's generation of the gods, he's in charge of all the other gods, right? That's henotheism, right? So um, in Hinduism, it's a kind of henotheistic model. There are hierarchies of gods, right? And Brahman is at the top of them all. When it comes to all the gods other than Brahma and Shiva, who create and retract the world, Vishnu himself is the top god for all the gods in the world because the, they're all manifestations of him okay so then there's this thing that i'm calling it ishta devism 
The word diva means God. The word deity comes from that. Divine comes from that. Diva comes from that word. A lot of words, by the way, in European languages are called Indo-European languages because they all go back to Sanskrit. They all have roots, and we'll see some of them as we're talking about this. right? But in the Yoga Sutras, which was written about 2,000 years ago by a great Indian yogi and sage and philosopher named Patanjali, right? he says that one of the meditation techniques that will help you to evolve spiritually is to visualize a visualization meditations when you close your eyes and visualize something and then try to become one with it somehow or embody it or whatever, right? So if you visualize fire, right, and you want to cultivate the power of fire, you would visualize Agni, the god of fire, right? And, um, you know, meditate on Agni, the god of fire, right? But Ishta Devi, uh, Ishta means something like chosen or favorite, right? So you get to pick your own god in this form of Hinduism, right? And there's so many gods in the Hindu pantheon. So there's a word, pan means all, and theon, theo means god, right? So the lineup of all the gods, right? When Socrates says, don't the gods disagree? He's referring to the pantheon, and there's a big, beautiful uh, structure in Greece, the Pantheon, which they had the statues of all the gods, right? With the big columns and everything. That's a Pantheon, uh, the Pantheon, right? But in Hinduism, you've got a vast Pantheon of all these different gods. And different villages in India and parts of India favor one god or the other, just like in different parts of Italy or Spain or whatever, some of the France, like different areas might favor a certain saint right, who came from that region or something, and they all pray to that saint, right, like St. Francis of Assisi. So people in Assisi, Italy, you know, they might pray to St. Francis or Padre Pio, another saint, a recently canonized saint in, in I think, in your lifetime, most of you. Uh, maybe not. I forget what year he was canonized. I think around 2003. Maybe not. Depends on how old you are. Um, okay, so I'm going on and on and on. But, um, so that's the other thing. So you've got everything is God. There's one God. There's many gods. There's a hierarchy of gods. And then there's the pit. You get to pick your own God, right? So it's kind of like, like Whole Foods, you know, supermarket. You can just kind of find almost any vegetable in there, making an analogy between vegetables and gods. All right. So it's a blend of all of those things. And there's no one word for that kind of religion, which blends all of them. But Ironically, the word Catholic means universal. Um, the Catholic Church named itself universal um, because I think one of the reasons was like in Judaism, you had to be born Jewish to be Jewish, right? But the Christians um, had this attitude of opening up Judaism to the point where you don't have to be born Jewish to be Jewish. You have to have faith in God to be a true Jew, right? Something that the people born Jewish might not really like unless they were themselves the early Christian followers of Jesus, right? Um, but the word Catholic literally means universalistic, right? Open to the end, right? So Hinduism is a kind of truly universalist attitude or, or religion because they believe that all religions are the same. Every different religion, even Native American ones like the Mayas and the in Incas who believed in Quetzalcoatl or performed human sacrifices, no matter what religion it was, if there was a holy man or a prophet or an avatar, uh, you know, a god, a messiah, you know, whatever, whoever, whatever, right, some kind of saint, those are all believed to be either direct incarnations of the god Vishnu or some pipeline, like when the muses would um, inspire it or possess a poet and speak through its mouth, right? So it's like a partial incarnation or a temporary incarnation of Vishnu, right? That's what mediums, a medium, someone who's possessed, the spirit is in you temporarily, right? So that's still considered to be Vishnu, right? The spirit of God that intervenes in the world is Vishnu, right? So, and then the idea is that God is like a parent who has children of different ages. So if you have a baby, 
you speak to it a certain way. If you have a four-year-old, you speak to it a different way. If you have a 13-year-old, you speak to it a different way. And if your child is an adult, you speak to it a different way, right? So this idea is that different human cultures throughout history are at different stages of evolution and they have different beliefs and different circumstances. And depending on that, God is always malleable and flexible. And when God intervenes in the world, God intervenes in a way that the people at that time will recognize as God, as divine. And so God comes in, in an infinite number of forms, even as animals, elephant God, monkey God, doesn't matter, right? So that's the idea that every religion is true. Every religion is part of Hinduism. It might not be orthodox, but it's still the same. It's all one. There's only one. It's all the same, right? That's the issue. And so God, the God, there's a Hindu scripture called the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavan or Bhagavad means Lord, which is a term of respect for God. And Gita means song, right? So it's the it's God's song or the celestial song, the song of the gods, right? And it's a it's a scripture, and in it, the God Krishna, who's he's a god on earth, right? Like Jesus is kind of like the same thing, right? Uh, Jesus in, in Christianity is believed to be God incarnate in human flesh, right? That's an avatar from the Hindu perspective. So the, the God Krishna was like Jesus in ancient India who walked the earth. And one before him was the God Rama who walked the earth. And there's a number of these gods who were born as direct and full avatars of Vishnu, meaning it was Vishnu the whole time, not just some temporary mediumship or possession, right? So the God Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, it's a, it's a, a dialogue between Krishna and, and a warrior, Arjuna, a great warrior who feels a feeling of pacifism and doesn't want to hurt. He, some of his enemies are his friends, but they wound up on the opposite sides of the war. And he has pangs of conscience and Krishna tells him, hey, you're a warrior, it's your duty, it's your dharma. Right? Don't worry about it. Souls are eternal, right? But in the conversation, right, Krishna gives him this whole speech about spiritual metaphysics, about karma and reincarnation and God and all that. And Krishna says, look, it's all good. All roads lead to me. All religions lead to me. I am all gods. Whenever God manifests anywhere in the world, it's me. And I'm the whole world, right? So you got the whole thing coming right there out of Krishna's mouth. So, okay. So here's a little extra credit assignment that uh, some of you might not find out about if you didn't watch this video. So you have to go find it on the website and do it, all right? But extra credit in the discussion board, right? That's where I want you to do this. And there's a, a heading for it that you might not see because it's not in the same place where your normal access to that is. Um, but this week, this learning unit is when I want you to do it, but you'll have two weeks to do it, right? Invent your own religion, right? It's not in the same place as this week's discussion board, which is about this regular, this lecture that I'm giving you, right? But it's in the next forum below that called My Invented Religion. The instructions are there. I'm not gonna sp spell it out here. Right, you have two weeks to do it. It's worth three points, whereas your normal discussions are week once a week are only worth one and a half points. This is double, so it's worth two weeks. So, you've been, some of you've been asking me, "Hey, is there any extra credit?" There you go. Invent your own religion. Do, do, do very carefully. Read the instructions and do it right. Okay, All right. this should be fun. Inventing your own. I always wanted to invent my own religion. Never got around to it. Okay, so some. Ideas from the Upanishads, which are called Upanishadic, right, um, is that we go from gods to the self, right? So the Vedas, the earlier Vedas, I said, are all focused on ritual, Rita, upholding cosmic order, and duty, Dharma, right? It's all God-based and duty-based, duties to the gods. It's Euthyphro's world, right? Piety is service to the gods, right? Well, the later Vedas, the Upanishads, oh, by the way, Upanishad, I forget what the word breakdown is, but it means something like, come here and listen, or come close and hear me, right? Because the sages, the gurus, who were the teachers of the Upanishads, 
right? Wanted their students to sit close to them when they imparted their wisdom to them, right? Come listen to God uh, coming out of my mouth, right? And in this, in the later Vedas, the Upanishads, right? There's a shift in culture, in the wider culture, but also in the scriptures themselves, because they reflect that, right? Um, where the search turns into a search for personal enlightenment, spiritual, uh, personal spiritual enlightenment, spiritual transcendence, right? Where it's this Neoplatonic idea of transcendence, right? Instead of me focusing on my role upholding this outer part of the world, near the edges of that big model where the things moving on the edge, the many, right? I want to go and become the one myself, right? So you've got a whole new culture of wandering spiritual seekers. And this has been going on uh, since then, and it's still going on now, um, that there are, you know, countless spiritual seekers wandering. They're, they're uh, homeless, intentionally homeless. They've taken to the whole, the monastic life in the better part of India is not in monasteries, it's in the, in the forests and in the streets, right? So people living in nature, like um, Diogenes, the cynic, right? Let go of all of your attachments, wealth and fame and possessions, those are meaningless, go on a spiritual journey for enlightenment, right? Ironically, Diogenes right around the same time, right? So this is what this has been going on in India since then. To this day, you've got wandering monks, right? Experimenting with every conceivable spiritual technique, right? So there's a shift from those rituals designed to appease the gods and uphold Rita, this euthyphro-like behavior, to a search for personal liberation. The word is moksha, which means freedom or liberation, right? To become freed from the body, freed from those concerns that Diogenes let go of to renounce the world, because the physical world, if you're looking at that, you're looking in the wrong place, you need to look within and find the self and transcend and become one with the one, right? And the one is Brahman, right? That's the cosmic soul or the world soul, but beyond that, the one, right? In the Neoplatonic distinction, the name for the individual soul in Hinduism is Atman, A-T-M-A-N, the Atman, the self, with a capital S is the Atman or the soul, right? And there's a saying that the Atman is Brahman. You're like a wave and focusing on waves and what distinguishes this wave from that wave. But how can we focus on the ocean? Because we're all the ocean. We're just waving as individuals. Let's transcend our individuality and become one with the one, right? And so the focus is on meditation and yoga and self examination and self-mastery, controlling your desires and your perceptions and your senses and your behavior and your actions, so that that's all geared instead of toward Rita, toward enlightenment, toward the attainment of nirvana or enlightenment, right? It's much more philosophical. It's less euthyphro-like, less rituals, less religious. And that's a picture of um, a famous yogi guru in India in the 1900s named Sri. Sri is a title like Your Holiness. It means something like that. Yukteswar, um, famous guru. Oh, and that's the end. Wow, look at that. Let me go back. I'll take a look at that guy. I'll say a little bit more about him. He was the guru of another famous yogi who was one of the first yogis to come to the West and lecture and founded a whole bunch of um, spiritual centers around the world. The name of his organization is Self-Realization Fellowship, SRF. And there's one of them, I think it's still there in Manhattan. Or maybe I'll come up with an extra credit assignment and send you guys there, that would be cool. Um, it's all about meditation, uh, the Self-Realization Fellowship. Um, yeah, very interesting stuff. Oh, and Yogananda, his disciple, Swami Paramahansa, which means swan, something like that. Yogananda. Yoga is not just the poses. Yoga poses, by the way, that are widespread. Everybody does them now. 
are just the preliminary to get your body limber and strong so that you can sit upright like Sri Yukteswar there in the picture in a meditation posture comfortably and be still and learn to control your body so you can just put it there, kind of shut it down and focus on bringing your mind into contact with the one. That's the purpose of yoga poses, but yoga means union and union is a form of becoming uno, U-N-O, uno means one, union is to make one, to unite, to bring two together and form one. Yoga means to yoke, literally, to yoke together, to link, to unite. It means to become one. So yogis are people who practice not just postures, traditionally, but meditation, right? They're yogis. Um, and you, when you practice yoga, you are trying to become one with the universe, with the, the Neoplatonic one, but not conceived as a Neoplatonist thing, okay? So pretty cool, huh? Um, oh yeah, so Yogananda wrote this famous book that you can get, I think, for free on the internet nowadays called Autobiography of a Yogi. And there's even an audio version of it that I think is free. It was an excellent book. Um, I read that when I was a teenager and I was blown away by the stories of all the phenomenal lives of these Hindu yogi saints. And so many of them, are like saints in the Christian tradition, believed to have this or that kind of power or form this or that kind of miracle. Just fascinating, even if none of it's true, it's totally fascinating stuff. Um, all right, let me um, stop the screen share. So you can see me once again before we go. So look, um, that's the world view. Right? That's the context of the mythic era in ancient India, right? in which the Vedas and the Upanishads were orally transmitted for centuries before they were written down, and which informs Indian culture to this day in the same way that Homer and the Odyssey and the Iliad informed Greek culture up until around the time of the Neoplatonists, right? Um, of course, it changed a lot in the course of a few centuries. But the interesting and exciting thing about Hinduism is that it, it hasn't changed that much. Um, all that stuff that I said about the past, it's still going on in India. Although India is modernizing, you've got swamis and gurus with cell phones and with internet, you know, like going to mass, uh, they call it darshan or satsang. Darshan is a word that means, and you're going to learn this in the next video, it means vision, right? Literally. Um, so when there's a holy man and you go to see the holy man and get his, it's like if Jesus was walking the earth, you would want to go get his darshan to go meet him and have a vision of him because by looking through him, you're seeing God, right? That's the belief that Christians had, right? Or Moses or Muhammad, right? No matter who the, the saint or holy man or prophet is, right? When you go to see a saint, a holy man or a woman or a prophet or a guru, you're believed to be, to, to, you're believed to be having vision of God through them. You're seeing some aspect of God. You're getting a darshan, right? But the word also means vision in terms of a worldview, so the six major philosophies of Orthodox Hinduism, you'll learn next week, are called darshans also, right? But now satsang, I mentioned that word, sat means truth, and a sangha is a community. So a satsang is a community of spiritual seekers all seeking the truth, the ultimate truth with a capital G, a, a T, when, when Jesus says, I am the truth right? I am the way, I am the life, right? This, this is the logos. I am the logos, right? So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that his ego is that. It, according to Yogananda, the guy that I just mentioned, he says that when Jesus says that, it's more like, he didn't use the word logos, but it's as if the logos is speaking through him. Yogananda's called it the Christ consciousness, like right? the cosmic mind is speaking through through Jesus, not as his personal, individual human personality, but as this deeper part that he's completely in connection with, right? Of course, they believe he's Vishnu, 
right? He's God incarnate. Um, not the only one, but maybe that's the only difference, right? Most Christians think, well, he's the only one who really has that status, right? Um, okay, so like, once again, that's the background of all the stuff that you're going to learn about Hinduism, uh, Orthodox and unorthodox Indian darshans or philosophies, visions of reality as they are understood uh, in the next lecture. I hope this was interesting. I can't imagine that it wasn't. But, you know, there's a saying I'll give you. Um, I, I forget where I heard this, but uh, it goes something like this. If you're generally bored with things, it's not the things themselves. It's more like you're boring, right? So like this is a stoic attitude, right? It's not the external events in the world that are stressful on the one hand, anxiety provoking, right? If something is too stressful, it's anxiety provoking. It's too challenging to you. But if it's not challenging enough, it's boring to you, right? So <clears throat> the stoic idea, remember, the dichotomy of control, whether or not something is stressful or boring is more a function of you because that's something you're in control of. That's something under your control. How your mind responds to whatever reality delivers to you, right? So here, Professor Petty is preaching to you. If you find yourself with lots of anxiety or lots of boredom, you're not adjusting what you can control, which is the way you relate to the world. Right? It's not the world and what it presents to you, although sometimes the challenges are overwhelming or underwhelming, but how you deal with them, that's something within your power, right? Boredom and anxiety are not enough stimulation, too much stimulation, right? But it, that's the normal understanding of it, right? But from the stoic point of view, it doesn't matter whether there's too much stimulation or not enough stimulation, anxiety, boredom, but too much or too little of an appropriate response to those things from you, all right? So Professor Petty here trying to show you how philosophical understanding can be just as insightful, if not more insightful than what you might get from your psychotherapist, right? I'll leave you with that note, but oh yes, let me take this opportunity to plug what we call philosophical counseling, right? Because I'm a philosophical counselor. That's philosophers doing the equivalent of what psychotherapists do, only it's not necessarily anything like what they do in one sense, because, well, when you engage with a philosophical counselor, all you're doing is having a conversation with Socrates. Right. And remember, Euthyphro's conversations with Socrates or, or anybody else's, right? They can be kind of disquieting or they can disabuse you of false beliefs. Right. But when you're working with a philosophical counselor, right, they're your friend. They're there to help you, not to rip you apart. Right. So, um, and all psychology comes out of philosophy, by the way. Every great psychologist is a kind of philosopher of mind. And William James was one of the first, and he opened up the first psychology department at Harvard in the early 1900s, I believe, prior to which there was no such thing as psychology. Psychology was just philosophy of mind, right? So philosophers are eminently well-suited to do the kind of work that psychologists do. The only difference is that psychologists are also trained to recognize and deal appropriately with mental illness. Right? So one of the founders of psychology in the United States, Lou Marinoff, who wrote this awesome book that you might want to read about it if you're interested in, it's called Plato, not Prozac, right? Because yeah, you know, the psychological profession, the psychiatry and everything, what do they do? They prescribe Prozac and things like that to everybody. You know, you're not happy here, take some happiness pills. Right. But um, as Lou Marinoff says in Plato, not Prozac, right, it's therapy for the sane, which doesn't mean that everybody who goes to a psychologist is insane or suffering from mental illness. Right. But many of the problems that people standardly bring to psychologists 
are just philosophical or existential issues, practical problems, right? Confusion about purpose, their meaning in life, their career choice, career change. Should I stay in this marriage? Or I have a moral dilemma, or I'm confused about this. Uh, I wanted to, you know, speak to a professional about my circumstances, right? So it's called therapy for the same, right? All right, so if you wanna see and read more about it, go to my website. Um, what's it called? RickRepetti.com. R-I-C-K-R-E-P-E-T-T-I. -E -E I have a whole bunch of stuff there about philosophical counseling. All right. And oh, just keep this in mind, right? When my former students come to me and they want some philosophical counseling, I don't charge them. So that's one of the benefits that you get from being a former student of mine. Not, not a current student. I don't see current students, except in my office hours, I'm your professor, I'm not your philosophical counselor. Although, you know what, most philosophy professors in their office hours are pretty much doing philosophical counseling about students' academic lives, and maybe their career choices. <laughs> All right, folks, sorry I dragged this out, but you know, we got to do what we can when we can to help people in ways that go way beyond the Dharma the moral re responsibility or obligation, our duties connected with our roles. Well, my role as a philosopher is to be a philosophical counselor to people. And that goes beyond the credits and the lessons in the course. So there you go. All right. See you next time.